Fred B. here. In this video, I'm going to take the circuit analysis of the Tesla hairpin circuit to a whole new level. Now the hairpin circuit is a fairly simple circuit. It could really hardly be more simple. You have a transformer that's fed from the mains power supply and that and then on the secondary you have it's attached to a spark gap and then to two capacitors which feed two rods and between these two rods there can be a shunt or various loads attached, lamps, etc. So the circuit itself could hardly be more simple. These devices were used for a variety of things back in the day. This is the device I built and have been experimenting with. It's been quite interesting. I used a neon sign transformer. Here's the circuit, my basic circuit that I used. And in order to gain a better understanding of this device, I built a spice model of the circuit, including a spark gap. I got a simple spark gap model and tried to run a simulation of the circuit. Now here, points D and points E represent the base of the rods and the lines moving to the right from there represents the rods and the line moving vertically from D down to E or the corners there represents the shunt between the rods that was in place when I made all these measurements. Now the spice simulation seemed to reflect or suggest there was only millivolts being produced in this device. Now here in this graphic the blue line in the top window is the input voltage from the main supply. The red line is the input current into the primary from the main supply. And the green line is the voltage at point D in the schematic. You can see it's measuring a peak of about 4 millivolts. Now the DC resistance of the rods and the shunt totaled to be about 0 0.1 ohms so whatever current here is going through the rods it's producing a voltage across the resistance of 0 0.1 ohms. In this next image again blue is the input voltage, red is the input current and here green is the current that's flowing through the shunt. We can see that the simulation suggests there's only 70 milliamps of current flowing through the shunt. This simulation results got me wondering just how could this thing be lighting up love bulbs, burning out bulbs, lighting up fluorescent bulbs with just contact on one end with millivolts and milliamps. This led me to decide to hook up my oscilloscope to the output of the hairpin and see what kind of results displayed concerning the waveform and the voltages at the base of the rods. To do this, I built this voltage divider. This is approximately a 10 to 1 voltage divider. There are two 470K resistors on each end. Those are the two dark brown resistors. They are 1 watt. And ironically, the big beige resistors are 1 half watt, 100K resistors. So between the middle and each end, it's a total of 1,040 ohms, and the 100K resistor constitutes about a 10, 1 to 10 uh, ratio in there. It's actually 1 to 10.4, but it's close enough. This, the red lead at the center of these, the two 100 ohm, 100K ohm resistors, goes to the ground lug on the neon sign transformer which is connected to point B, the center tap between the secondary windings and at this point I also connected the ground from the oscilloscope. And here I'm measuring the voltage at point D which is the base of the rod. 
in this quick clip here, we see I tried to, I had some trouble with the oscilloscope, the triggering process on the oscilloscope. It was very jerky as you can see. And, but in any case, we have the input waveform there, and then we have the voltage at point D. And point is here, we can see some spikes and approximately where they line up with the input waveform. Now this was very frustrating. Um, we can see more spikes at some times and less. But that's, that's what I got with the first try on the scope. Because the scope was so bad, I pulled out some good frames from the video. And here we can see the input voltage waveform. And there's some deformation of the sine wave of the mains current, whether that's due to the magnetic shunt in a neon sign transformer that limits its current, or it's due to the operation of the circuit itself, is beyond me at the present time. But we can, you know, this is the input waveform and its approximate position here to this next, which shows the spikes. And the thing to realize here are there are groups of voltage spikes that l appear to be located just after the peaks of the input voltage waveform. The first thing I noticed was that the waveforms on the oscilloscope were completely different from the SPICE model. So I decided that the SPICE model was too simplistic and it had to go. So I got a better spice model for a gas discharge tube shown here. And this was produced by a guy by the name of Christophe Basso, who's a French consultant to IntuitSoft. And he made this model. And one of the very interesting things here is that we see that there's lead inductance is one of the first components. This spice model worked a lot better and this lead inductance turned out to be a very important part of this model. Here's the waveforms produced, the voltage at node D produced by the new spark gap model. And here we see again we have the input voltage and current waveforms. We see that just past the peak of the voltage waveform, we get these succession of voltage spikes of several hundred volts. And this is much more like what we saw on the scope. And here we can see that the center of the group of voltage spikes aligns very well with the peak in the input current. So we get these groups of voltage spikes centered around the peak of each input current swing. Now here, now that we have a spice model that's working reasonably in correlation with what's visible on the scope, that the general behavior is similar we can start exploring other aspects of the circuit in simulation. This is the current through the spark gap. And again, we have the input waveforms at the top. This time, the input voltage is green and the input current is blue. Now, one of the really surprising things we see here is that the input current, or the current through the spark gap spikes at about 6 kilo amps, 6,000 amps. And then this current spike is what's generating those voltage spikes that we've seen. This was a surprise. And this explains why when you put the capacitors on the output of the transformer, why that arc without the capacitors, the arc is just a tiny little purple thing. 
because the current going through it is the current that's coming out of the transformer. In neon signs transformers, it, the one I have is 120 milliamps, but people are usually using ones with 30 milliamps. So you're getting an arc with 30 milliamps of current. Here we can see we're getting arcs with 6,000 amps peak current. Now this happens because the equivalent series resistance of the capacitors is so low it's practically zero. So you have all the charge that's stored up in the capacitors discharging through the spark gap practically instantaneously. And that's what generates these multi kilo amp current spikes. Now we can take a closer look at the current spike and we see here it's peaking right at 6,000 kiloamps and then we can see a ring down and if we zoom in a little more on the spike we can see that well the spice simulator dropped off the time scale at the bottom of this but I measured it in the simulator itself and the width of the bottom of the spike turned out to be about 120 picoseconds so we have a 6,000 amp current spike that lasts for only 120 picoseconds. Okay, going back to the scope here, I found a better way to trigger the tracking of the oscilloscope. And here, we're zooming in on one of the voltage spikes. Now here we can see a high frequency burst that lasts at the beginning say third of the screen and then a much lower amplitude lower frequency ring down following that. We can see the shape here of the burst which has got a downward spike of several hundred volts and comes up you know a, a couple of hundred. And changing the time base here we can examine the time period between the peaks of the waveform and the horizontal axis here is about is 0 0.1 microseconds so between the peaks is 0 0.22 microseconds or so which works out to be 4.6 4.7 megahertz okay in this video we're looking at the low frequency portion of the current spike that follows the high frequency burst. And we can see it lasts for, you know, close to 10 repetitions and before it gets too small. The amplitude here is only about 35 volts or so. This is 20 volts per vertical division. You can see the peaks are about six microseconds apart. These are one microsecond horizontal divisions, which works out to be about 170 kilohertz. This switching back for the overview here. I really kind of want to get an idea of the general shape of the initial burst and then successive ring down. Here's an image from the spice simulator. I had to go back and play with the parameters in the spice simulator quite a bit and so I got them to match, give a general close approximation to the shapes and the lengths and frequencies of the waveform seen on the oscilloscope. So this is what I've come up with. And we can see we have an initial high frequency burst that lasts for, well here it's a several 
microseconds and then the lower frequency ring down of much lower amplitude and we can see that the spikes of the initial high frequency burst are several hundred volts and the lower frequency ring down is much smaller here about maybe 50 volts. There are some small differences between the amplitudes and the shapes fairly small but I think this correlation is sufficient to say that what I've got going on in the simulation is reasonably close to what's actually going on in the circuit. Here's a close-up view of the initial high frequency burst. Now, through the spice simulation here, I can I have discovered that the hairpin circuit contains three significant LC resonances. And remember, our formula for the resonance, for an LC resonance, from the first analysis. And here, the first resonance I have already identified in the first analysis is the transformer secondary inductance with the main caps. And here, remember I simplified the hairpin circuit to that of a tank circuit and showed that resonant relationship. The second resonance I realized was here once I got the better spark gap model. And that resonance is the spark gap lead inductance in the main caps. Here again is the spark gap model I'm using. The lead inductance plays a surprisingly influential part. Now in my build I used eighth inch tungsten these are pure tungsten welding rods and I used the straight wire conductor inductance method to, to figure out the inductance of these welding rods and that inductance turned out to be about 160 nanohenries a piece so the two rods in series works out to be about 320 nanohenries. And that's the figure I used in the SPICE model and it works. And it's surprising that it works. I had to adjust the parasitic capacitance for the secondary and the neon sign transformer to get the frequency to match. But that straight ahead calculation for the inductance of the straight conductors, the welding rods, works perfectly in the space simulation. The third resonance is the inductance and the capacitance of the rods. This begins to involve transmission line theory. And transmission line theory is beyond the scope of this video. But I'll attempt to surmise it that in two parallel conductors, there exists a distributed inductance and capacitance and losses on a per unit length of those conductors. This state of affairs in combination with the length of the conductors sets up a resonant frequency between the conductors and it also sets up an impedance, an optimal impedance for the input and output from this to this transmission line, from and to this transmission line. So I tried to capture the effect of the inductance and the capacitance here in my SPICE model. I made some measurements with a digital multimeter for the inductance, but since I'm running the shunt, measuring the capacitance, because the shunt was in place became a difficult thing, so I had to figure out the capacitance by trial and error.
the simulator until I got it to match up the frequencies. Now this is kind of a, an approximate approach. There might be a better way to do it, but it got the simulator to perform at least to my satisfaction reasonably well to what I was seeing on the scope. Now, tram transmission line theory is also related to leecher lines and both transmission line theory and leecher lines are significant to the behavior of the Tesla hairpin circuit. With, I guess it's Letcher lines. With Letcher lines, you begin to take in the finite propagation speed of waves going up and down the conductors. And because there is a finite propagation speed, that generates or allows to develop higher voltages between two points along the lines than one would ordinarily expect to find using just DC instantaneous electricity calculations. Because you have a constructive and destructive interference patterns set up along the lines. And so this explains how high voltages can be produced in the hairpin circuit, higher voltages even than what the transformer and capacitors are putting into the lines because of this interference patterns. Now normally this takes place at very high frequencies and the length, the length of the lines need to be at least a quarter wavelength long. Now, the length of the rods I used to make that the qu a quarter wavelength of a frequency to put them into it, that frequency would have to be 35 megahertz or, or higher uh, to fit for a quarter wavelength to fit on the rods. And I think all the frequencies that are present in my hairpin circuit are lower than 35 megahertz. I didn't see anything higher than the 5 megahertz. But my scope's only 5 megahertz scope, so who knows. But I know the rods are too short to set up any interference patterns, significant interference patterns for the frequencies that I observed. Things could get different if I were to put higher frequencies into the rods or use longer rods. Now he, these things, these two, the transmission line theory and Letcher line theory, are there for you to explore if you want to get into this deeper. The math gets quite heavy and the theory gets deep, but it's all good stuff. Okay, and to wrap this up, I have one last little bit here. A lot I've seen a lot of videos on hairpin circuits where people are putting various loads on the hairpin circuit and saying, look the the input power goes down when I put a load on, on the circuit. What's going on here? Well, the transmission line has a characteristic impedance. And when you put a load on the far end of the rods that match that char characteristic impedance, the power going through the rods is going to be at a maximum. You also have to match the feed end of the rods, but I found that in my hairpin build that a load of 75 ohms, at least for the simulator, was the optimal load. And at that load, the transformer drew maximum current, which in my case was uh, about 127, 128 watts, the simulator. And once I moved the load, increased or decreased the resistance of the load, the current dropped off from there. Now, it, the current actually dropped off, and then as the resistance went to zero, the current kind of peaked up a little bit again. But it only dropped off to maybe 119 watts, 120 watts, and then peaked up again to maybe 122 watts as the, the load resistance went to zero.
So I, I think there's an absence of anything unusual. It's just the way the this thing works. Uh, it's not producing extra energy. And again, people have said there's a, there have been an absence of any over unity claims with this device. But it's just a very interesting, very interesting thing. And the main reason to understand this device is because this transformer setup with the spark gap and the capacitors forms the foundation that Tesla used in all his early uh, coils, his resonator coils and stuff. So this was, this was the, uh, the beginning of all of Tesla's high frequency, high energy work.